So we are very fortunate today to continue the series of webinar that uh, Kings has initiated, the Kings India Institute has, has initiated, and I'm very grateful to Vignesh for taking care of it. Uh, we are very fortunate today because we are going to explore a major issue that remains rather understudied in spite of the efforts of uh, one of the uh, uh, speakers, the speaker today, and, and his co-author Catherine Adeni, who is also with us um, among the participants. Uh, this, this is an emerging topic, really, that has been dealt with by Andrew Small some time ago, but that is gaining momentum, the uh, relations between China and, and Pakistan. And uh, Filippo, who will uh, present his views on this topic, is better placed than anybody to deal with it. Uh, Filippo has joined the Department of Politics and Inter International Studies uh, as a lecturer uh, at the um, Open University. Uh, and before that, he was a teaching fellow at the University of Birmingham and a visiting fellow at the University of Nottingham, Asia Research Institute. And is the author of this great book that was published last year by Rotledge, Sino-Pakistani Relations, Politics, Military, and Regional Dynamics. And this is exactly the title he has kept for us today, uh, with a great ambitious an ambition, therefore, to cover the whole fac all the facets of, of these bilateral relations, of these bilateral relations between China and Pakistan. So I'm going to leave the floor to him immediately, because to cover such a huge domain in 30, 35 minutes is rather challenging but you will do it. And after that, we will have the same amount of time for the Q&A. Uh, Q&A on Zoom are uh, rather challenging. So I will ask you to send your questions um, on the chat and I will ask the questions myself to, uh, to Filippo, uh, gathering together uh, the questions that can be merged. Um, but please uh, do uh, ask your questions uh, by the end or before the end uh, of, of his talk that will uh, last 30 uh, or 35 minutes. Filippo, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I'll try to share my screen. Let's see if it works. Um, should work now, right? Okay, here we are. Um, first of all, uh, I would like to thank very much Professor Jafrilo for his introductory remarks and the King's Institute and the, the Lao China Institute for hosting this seminar and for giving me the opportunity of discussing about my research, my work, and, 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 and partly about the book that I will discuss um, in today's presentation. This is a topic that, uh, as Professor Jafrilo was saying, I mean, I think it has really evolved significantly, especially over the past seven years. And I'll try to, to sort in the next half an hour to provide um, uh, some snapshots into the relationship and I'd be happy to take um, further discussions forward during the Q&A. So to give you an overview of what I'm going to talk about, um, uh, I will first start with a brief introduction, um, sort of outlining my approach to the topic, which is mostly through the prism of Pakistan's domestic politics. And I will try to explain why I think this is important and, and it's a relevant way to look at it. Um, I will then provide a, a snapshot into the structure, framework, and methods that I've used in the book and that's in, that has informed um, uh, mostly my research um, to date. Um, I will then um, move on to, to provide some sort of context to the more current dynamics because I think it's important to contextualize how the relationship has evolved in the past 20 years and the trends that we can find in the early 2000s that really then shape what happens um, as far as CPEC is concerned and the wider Sino-Pakistani relationship as we see today. Um, I will then zoom in into the domestic and regional dynamics of the China-Pakistan Economic Corridor, which is one of the case studies that I've uh, analyzed in the book. Um, and I will explain why I think this is important, but I think it's pretty much self-explanatory. CPEC has been at the very center of discussions, not only as far as Pakistan is concerned, but in general about China's Belt and Road Initiative 
broadly conceived. So I think it's really interesting to look at it a bit more in detail. Um, and then I will draw some final conclusions, uh, both on CPEC and the way ahead and how it's sort of developing, but at the same time on the wider Sino-Pakistan relationship and where I see it going uh, in, the next, uh, in the next few years. So uh, before um, I start and I dive a little bit more into the empirical discussion, I think it's interesting to look at China-Pakistan relations as one of the topics that it's really defined um, Asia's geopolitics in the past five to seven years. Um, Pakistan has been really at the heart of you know, the, the US-China global competition. And this was um, very visible when Ambassador Alice Wells went to Pakistan, um, made some, some quite blunt remarks as far as the China-Pakistan economic corridor is concerned. First in November, um, 2019, then these were reiterated in May 2020, uh, where she was essentially raising concerns about debts, transparency, um, and all the sort of implications that the financing under the China-Pakistan Economic Corridor was having. Of course, there was a pushback from both the Pakistani Foreign Office and the Chinese Embassy uh, in Islamabad, but I think this gave, gives us a sense of how important Pakistan is as a sort of battleground in the wider global competition between China and the United States. At the same time, debates have appeared in the media about the domestic political dimension that it's preeminent in Pakistan, as I will show in this presentation today. Uh, one of the latest reports was essentially putting forward the idea that the army was getting a greater grip uh, and control over the projects coming under the the China-Pakistan Economic Corridor, and one of the most recent articles was related to the difficulties or the challenges that the two sides are facing as far as the financing of CBET projects are concerned. Um, finally, there was this interesting article which was published in Contemporary South Asia at the end of 2019, I think it was in December 2019, which was essentially questioning Pakistan's decision to align with China and moving progressively away from the United States. Um, and I think it's quite an interesting piece because it, it's a viewpoint and, uh, and it really enriches the debate and it shows how varied is the debate about Pakistan's foreign policy decisions at the time, at the moment. So overall, what I hope this introduction gave us is a sense of how multilayered is really the, the relationship between Pakistan and China and the debates around it. And I will try to sort of cover a few of these points in today's presentation. Uh, and, and I'd be happy to take, of course, questions around it also in the q and um, Why do I look at China-Pakistan relations through the prism of Pakistan's domestic politics? I think there are three main reasons why I think it's important to do so. The first one is that the relationship now really transcends the exclusive foreign policy dimension. And this has been especially the case since we've seen the since we've seen the, the development of the Belt and Road Initiative in Pakistan. So China's engagement with Pakistan has really entered into the economic, political, and social fabric of Pakistan in a way that was really unprecedented. So I think it's important to assess how this engagement has worked out. The second point, which um, since the advent of the BRI, and I think this is a point which applies more broadly to uh, countries across the Belt and Road Initiative. This has been portrayed as sort of passive, nearly passive recipients of Chinese investments. Uh, but actually what we've seen is that the, the projects that have been implemented and, and how the BRI unfolds on the ground is the result of complex set of negotiations between the agendas of domestic political and local actors uh, coupled with China's priorities, China's interests, and China's agenda. So it's not just a matter that the BRI is parachuted into recipient countries, but there is also a sort of agency that countries, that the BRI partner countries can exercise. So looking at these dynamics, I think, unearths the complexities behind China's global push. And finally, and closely related to the previous point, it brings really to the fore the domestic political context in BRI recipient countries. What we've seen is that these dynamics have been really internalized in the domestic politics of Pakistan. 
whether it was about the, the economic implications, whether it was the, the alignment of the corridor that I will discuss later on, whether it was about the security dimension, CPEC has really been one of the regular staples in the newspaper, in the media, in the, in the general debates in Pakistan. So I think it's important to look at it part of it. Um, this sort of approach is reflected also in the book. Um, um, in the book, I look at three case studies. The first one is the port of Gwadar. Uh, the second one is the China-Pakistan economic corridor. And the third one are Sino-Pakistan relation in the Afghan context. And the main focus of the empirical chapters is between 2000 and 2018. Uh, there is also a background chapter which sort of provides the context of the relationship between the early 1950s onwards. Uh, but uh, the main focus of, 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 the, of the research, it's on the, the more contemporary phase. Um, to, for, in each of these case studies, I've looked at four decision-making areas, economic policy, elite recruitment, internal security, and foreign policy. Uh, and this is also the structure that I will roughly adopt in the, in the next part of the presentation. Um, and drawing on the Heidelberg model of civilian control, I've assessed for each of these case studies and each of these decision-making areas the, the extent of military influence in the decision-making process. So this, in the hope to, to sort of really bring out and bring to the fore how the domestic political dimension really is preeminent in the relationship between Pakistan and China. Uh, before moving on, a quick note on the methods that I've used. It's, most of the research is based around semi-structured elite interviews that have been conducted in Pakistan uh, between 2015 and 2018. And this, of course, has been triangulated with primary and secondary sources, some of which I have also included in today's presentation. Um, so the background. Before we dive into CPEC and the empirical details, I think it's important to take a step back and look at the early 2000s as the sort of moment in which we find some of the early trends of what we see today. The first one development of the port of Gwadar, which started in 2001. The first phase was completed in 2006. Um, it went off the political radar for various reasons until 2013, when it was handed back to China and to the China ports, uh, overseas ports holding company. Um, what I think it's interesting to see here is that the, the, the way in which uh, the port of Gwadar and the first phase was financed, um, it's through a grant. Uh, and this is one of the ways in which uh, the CPEC development, uh, CPEC projects in Guadar are being financed. So it's either through a grant or an interest-free loan. So it's the same sort of pattern, which also tells us, um, I think, uh, about the, which is a testament, if you like, of the importance that the project has in the wider Sino-Pakistani partnership. Um, the second trend is really a point about the continuity that we've seen, regardless of the regime that was in power. So uh, the first discussions about the economic corridor came under General Musharraf's rule, who wanted to make the most on the one hand of Pakistan's geographic location as a sort of bridge for China to the, to the Gulf states. But at the same time, he wanted to open up for Pakistan the Central Asian market. Uh, and and the, the engagement that General Musharraf started to, to think of Pakistan as a potential corridor um, really continued under the PPP government and then was materialized in 2013 when uh, the, 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 the Pakistan Muslim League Nawaz government came to power. So uh, the point here is really about that regardless of the regime that we've seen, there has been a, a high degree of continuity in pursuing this idea of an economic corridor and of greater engagement, not only on the security dimension, which is the backbone of Sino-Pakistani ties, but also on the economic dimension. And the final point, which um, it's related to the previous one, is that in 2006, we see the signing of the first free trade agreement, which uh, started operating in 2007. And in the, in the, it's interesting because in uh, um, the second phase after years of negotiations was agreed in 2019 and became operational in January 2020. Um, if we were to provide a snapshot of Pakistan-China relations over the past 20 years, I think these two charts um, could help us quite a bit. The first one uh, shows the arm, 
arms exports to Pakistan from China and the US in the period under examination. And what we see is that apart from four years, um, China is, emerges as the major arms supplier to Pakistan. And this is particularly the case since, since 2011. Um, on the economic dimension, uh, what we see is that it's always been the sort of weakest pillar in the relationship, um, not particularly well-developed economic ties until the BRI kicks in. Uh, and when the BRI comes in, what we see is that the, the, the trade grows, but also the trade imbalance, and the trade is highly tilted in China's favor, uh, also as a result of the heavy machinery that is needed, that was needed on CPEC projects. So the snapshot of the relationship is essentially a, a very strong defense component, which is the backbone of the relationship, to which the economic dimension has been added, to which the economic dimension has been attached, and in the, only in the past seven to eight years. Um, so now let's, let's get to the, to the China-Pakistan economic corridor. Why CPEC? As I was saying at the beginning of the presentation, I think the China-Pakistan economic corridor is really, um, it has become impossible to decouple China-Pakistan relations from CPEC since 2013. What we've seen is that almost all the developments related to the relationship between Pakistan and China have been developments, uh, have been covered by the China-Pakistan economic corridor as well. And if we were to provide a snapshot of what CPEC looked like, at least in the early harvest phase, I think these two pictures could help us quite a bit. The first one is the Port Kazim power plant, which is built in Sin. And the second one is the um, Orange Line, which is a mass transportation, transportation project in Lahore. Um, so the, the, the focus of, the, of CPEC at the very beginning was on energy generation in order to um, address the electricity, electricity shortages that the country um, was suffering from, uh, as well as infrastructure, so road, road uh, and rail networks as well. Um, as we all know by now, although I think this sort of flag flagship project definition has been a bit dropped in the, in the past couple of years, but it was defined as such by the Chinese Premier Li Keqiang. Um, the original estimates about the overall investment were in 2015 around 46 billion. It were re revised upwards in 2017 to 62 billion. Um, but in fact, what we've seen, and here there is a sort of hiatus between how the, the Chinese side, which has been always more conservative on the estimates and the Pakistani side, which has, been, which has tried to push it a little bit more, um, have been. But I think we're in the range between 25 to 29 billion of projects which have been either completed or are under construction. construction. And as, as we will see later on, I mean, this is by no means um, a small amount considering where it started and, and where the economic relationship was in 2013. So I think this is quite a substantive um, development. Uh, the lion's share, as I was saying, of projects was on infrastructure ones um, and again on energy generation. So the, the, the real heart of CPEC are these two pictures that are shown here in these slides. Um, in the next few slides, what I will try to do is to look at the different decision-making areas as far as the China-Pakistan economic corridor is concerned and to, and to assess this and, and, and see how they sort of evolve. The first one which I will look at is economic policy. And I think this is a particularly interesting one because the chief decision-making body of the China-Pakistan economic corridor is the Joint Cooperation Committee, JCC, which is organized around uh, different sub-working groups on energy, Gwadar, planning, economic zones, uh, and there have been another couple that have been added to uh, the list as during the latest visit in March by the Pakistani president to China. Um, if we look comparatively across BRI countries, the, the, the Joint Cooperation Committee is really one of the most institutionalized um, frameworks in which China operates. And it brings together on the Pakistani side, the ministry, uh, basically the planning commission, and on the, Pakistan, on the Chinese side, the National Development and Reform Commission, officials from both sides. 
Um, at a later stage, provinces, Pakistani provinces were added to it after they were excluded at the beginning. Um, and, and this is something we'll get to also later. But it's quite well structured and well functioning. And there have been preparatory meetings for the 10th JCC meeting, which, is, which should occur, I think, by the end of the year. What it's interesting also to see, and this goes back to the approach that I take in, in, to, to, to Sino-Pakistani relations, I think it's, it's interesting to look at the politics, domestic politics behind the, the, the overall control of the projects. Uh, and this has been a sort of cause of disagreement between civilian and military authorities. Under the PMLN government between 2013 and 2018, what we've seen is that the a greater desire, a desire for, of the military for greater control contrasted with how the PMLN wanted to retain its sway and control over the decision-making process. And after the PTI came to power in, in July 2018, what we've seen is a progressive dilution of civilian control with, through the establishment of the CPEC authority and the creation of the National Development Council. Um, so I think this, the, really, the, the creation of the CPEC authority has been at the very heart of how the PMLN and the military con were, were sort of contesting control over the project. And the result of this has been that, on the one hand, we've seen that key institutions and agencies um, tasked with the implementation of CPEC, again, the Joint Cooperation Committee, the National Highway Authority, which is the authority tasked with uh, most of the road works, have a DL helm civilian officials, but at the same time, the newly established CPEC authority is headed by the retired military official. And the narrative of CPEC, the, the hashtag CPEC making progress, which we've seen quite a bit uh, in the past few months over Twitter, has been mostly brought forward by the military, especially again in the past couple of years. So, um, the, the, the preeminence of the military here is it's pretty clear, as it is clear in the domain of internal security, which is another key area, given that most of the concerns, especially from the Chinese side, in terms of investing in Pakistan, were related to the country's uh, internal security and domestic situation. Um, there are a couple of components here. A land component, which has seen the establishment of a special security division of 15,000 uh, 15, um, men, um, which are tasked exclusively with the protection of Chinese national workers and uh, CPEC projects within Pakistan. But there is also a maritime component, going back to the importance that the port of Wadar has. Uh, so the Pakistan Navy established the Task Force 88, the Force Protection Battalion, um, a Coastal Security and Harbor Defense Force, which is uh, mostly focused on the Makran coastal high, uh, coast. Um, and there has been also um, reports about the use of private security contractors over CBEC projects. At the same time, there's the digital component, which I think it's, it's quite interesting and important. Uh, the fiber optic cable between Pakistan and China was one of the first, one of the early harvest projects which was completed, and it's developed by the Special Communications Organization, which is uh, a military linked organization. So um, here also the, the, the importance, the strategic importance of CPEC, if you like, comes really to the fore. Um, in this overview, uh, sorry, and, and, and the final point is also the, the, about the smart cities project. So basically, um, the idea of making safer urban areas within Pakistan um, by uh, investing in technology, CCTV, and so on and so forth. And, and most of the equipment for these smart cities projects also comes from Chinese companies. So that's one of the link, one of the markets where Chinese companies um, have, uh, are, are investing as well. Um, in this cursory sort of overview of how the, the, the China-Pakistan economic corridor is being developed, I think we cannot ex escape one of the most contentious issues that we've seen. Uh, and, and, and this is partly covered in the book, but mostly in the uh, Asian survey article that I've co-authored with uh, Professor Catherine Aidney at the University of Nottingham. Um, so this is um, 
this is the map of the China Pakistan economy of Pakistan, first of all, and then the China Pakistan economic corridor. Um, the early harvest projects, or the ones that were prioritized, were really along the eastern route, which is in this map here, which I hope you can see well, is the, is the sort of red line. Um, and, and, and some of these projects have been developed in Wadar. And as you can imagine, when a project is portrayed as a sort of game changer for the country, uh, as it was the, the China-Pakistan economic corridor between 2013 and 2015, uh, th there were great expectations that most parts of Pakistan would have benefited immediately from how the projects were being developed. Uh, what we've seen is instead in the first phase, which is being partially, partly, which is partly being readdressed uh, as a result of the change in government, most of the projects are, are concentrated in Sindh and Punjab. And these are also the ones that have been completed first. And in, in, in my research and in, in the research with Catherine, what we've sort of identified are a number of explanations for this. The first one is that potentially because the PMLN space was in Punjab, so they wanted to appeal to their own constituencies. Uh, and, and I think this is one of the, this is one of the areas where um, it was particularly interesting to see how the, the agendas of domestic political actors work. At the same time, and this came out from interviews uh, in, with, with key actors in Pakistan, there was China's desire to work on areas that were already developed and that could sort of show uh, how progress was, me, was being made. Um, and I think that the importance of this then, of these explanations points to one of the things that I was mentioning at the beginning, that the way in which projects BRI projects are actually unfolding on the ground is a complex set of interests and, um, and agendas coming from not just the Chinese side, but also from domestic political actors, as this sort of discussion um, demonstrates. And I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll move forward with the, with the presentation, but this is something that um, I mean, I'd be happy to discuss a little bit more um, if there are questions around it in the Q&A. There is also, of course, a regional dimension to the China-Pakistan economic corridor. And there have been a number of studies, not many, I have to say, but a number of studies looking at how economic corridors work. And one of the key elements that they say is that for an economic corridor to be successful, they have to be integrated within the region, regional networks, regional economies. And one of the key points and takeaways of these studies is that they do not function in isolation. So the question is to what extent is CPEC integrated in this region and whether the, the sort of geopolitical conditions are conducive to better integration. And I'm afraid that on this particular note, um, the outlook is not too positive or optimistic. Uh, as far as India and the China-Pakistan economic corridor are concerned, uh, India has always opposed CPEC on a number of grounds. The first one are sovereignty issues that have been raised uh, by India since um, uh, the, the Indian government claims that um, the China-Pakistan economic corridor goes through Gilgit-Baltistan, which is part of the wider Kashmir issue. The second point is that since ever since China and Pakistan started developing the port of Gwadar, there have been fears of Gwadar as a potential military base uh, or the potential dual uses of Gwadar um, and the, the sort of uh, fears that the investments in CPEC could sort of strengthen um, Pakistan's longstanding military partnership with, um, with China. And overall, the, Policymakers in New Delhi have seen CPEC and the China-Pakistan relationship as a, as a counterbalance to regional, to India's regional influence. So uh, very much uh, against the idea of the China-Pakistan economic corridor. Uh, and so it's certainly not something there have been there have been discussions that China at some point has also offered to rename the China-Pakistan economic corridor to, to sort of um, assuage some of the Indian concerns, but this the, the, the sort of proposal was dropped. I think we were around 2016, 2017. Um, if we look um, north in Afghanistan, the situation it's, 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 it's rather similar. Uh, since 2014, we've seen a renewed diplomatic push from Beijing. They've appointed the first um, um, Chinese envoy to Afghanistan. 
Pakistan has been involved in the in the Heart of Asia Istanbul process, uh, which has seen um, the coordination among a number of countries over the future of Afghanistan. But despite some renewed attempts to to sort of um, have a fresh start in Pakistan-Afghanistan relations, I think they're still following very much a past trajectory of tensions and mistrust. Uh, and so if, if, we, if we were to look at CPEC's expansion to Afghanistan, and, and there, there, all, there have also been discussions around it, I think this is quite um, an unlikely scenario, um, an unlikely scenario at the moment. Um, so if we, to, to sort of um, wrap up and, 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 and provide some general thoughts on the China-Pakistan economic corridor and how it's going ahead, uh, I think that in recent, in recent months, what we've seen is that projects have slowed down, in part because of COVID-19, but also because of difficulties in agreeing on the way forward. Um, I don't think it's a mystery by now that China was very comfortable dealing with the Pakistan Muslim League PMLN government, whereas there were difficulties at least in the early phases of the PTI government when it came to power. It was very vocal against, um, against the way in which CPEC projects were agreed by the previous by their predecessors. There were some cabinet members that made quite extraordinary remarks coming from Pakistani officials as far as CPEC is concerned. So I think at the beginning, there, were some, there was some sort of misalignment in terms of priorities, which seems to have been partly resolved. But it has resulted in a slowdown of the China-Pakistan economic corridor. Um, as part of this wider shift, which came as, as the change in leadership in Islamabad occurred, uh, what we've seen is, was a less focus on mega projects, but more on small scale social development ones, which were also one of the priorities that the PTI government has put in its electoral manifesto uh, ahead of the election. And finally, going back to the dimension of you know, the control and handling of the China-Pakistan economic corridor, the establishment of the CPEC authority is a sign of the strategic importance that CPEC has and on the preference that China to an extent has in dealing with uh, the, the, the Pakistani military to speed up the implementation. Uh, and as far as Pakistan's domestic politics are concerned, I think it's a clear indication of the dilution of civilian control over the China-Pakistan economic corridor in the past two years. What does this mean? What does this all mean for the, for the wider Sino-Pakistan relationship? First of all, despite what we've seen is that, I mean, when in 2017 people were saying $62 billion, that were that was really, really, really a big amount of money. What we've seen is that what has materialized on the ground were, are around 25 billion, which I, I would still argue it's very significant if we look at where the relationship started in 2013 and how the economic dimension has always been the weakest pillar there. Um, the slowdown in CPEC and the sort of recent misalignment, if you like, that we've seen between the the PTI government and their Chinese counterparts. I think despite this, the fundamentals of the relationship are quite solid. And this always relates to the military to military partnership that as I, I hope it came out from this presentation, it's, it's really one of the major strengths and an element of continuity, if you like, between uh, Pakistan and China. Um, and the long term term trajectory will likely see Pakistan even more reliant on China as part of this growing US China global competition, where we see that India and the US are finding more and more common ground, whereas Pakistan and China seem to be getting ever closer. Um, and, and I think this is a pattern, a trend that was set in motion uh, in 2011 and that has progressively strengthened in the past 10 years, and it's likely to be sustained. At the same time, I think that the economic engagement that we've seen between 2013 and 2017, so the really the major expansion of CPEC and, and of China's economic investments in Pakistan is unlikely to be replicated in the near future for a number of reasons, because the, the, the sort of 
mild pushback that there has been in Pakistan on CPEC between 2018 and 2019. It was, a, it was nowhere near what we've seen in other countries like Malaysia or, or even in the public statements. But at the same time, uh, it, it, I think it left the mark in the way in which the economic relationship worked. And while in 2013 there were hopes that by investing huge amounts of money, the, 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 the situation would have improved and the economic dimension in the relationship would have developed, it has indeed, but probably not the way in which it was envisaged originally. So I think that in, in, in the long term, in the long, taking a long view as far as China-Pakistan relations are concerned, the geopolitical component is still going to be strong, whereas the, the, the sort of economic dimension is probably going back um, to the to the pre twenty thirteen um, to the pre twenty thirteen levels. So um, I think I'll, I'll I'll stop here uh, and thank you very much for your attention and I look forward to the to the Q and A. Thank you. Thank you very much, Filippo, for this uh, very comprehensive and, and well-informed uh, presentation. Um, I, I fully agree with the uh, uh, argument uh, you, you made so convincingly uh, and, and the conclusions uh, you have just presented. Uh, I see no question yet in the chat, but I uh, will let people warm up by asking a few questions, if you, if you don't mind. And, uh, uh, you, you may not respond if other questions come in, um, but um, but there are a few things I, I, I'd like you to, to uh, uh, revisit. There is one uh, question that does not fit very well uh, in your in your presentation, so I'm not surprised you've not mentioning it. But still, a one-line question: Would the Uyghur issue one day be a problem for the? Uh, Pakistan-China relations? That's a big question in one line only. Uh, <laughs> to return to the regional question that you're asking, a corridor needs to be connected indeed. Can we imagine that um, Iran one day will be connected to this? The Iranians are really very much interested in being connected to Gwadar, but can the Saudis let the Pakistanis invest when like <laughs> you see the problem there is there is clearly a competition and 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 when mbs visited pakistan he made a point that he would like to invest in 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 Gwadar itself and clearly the chinese were not particularly happy with this so if you can explain for us what what is there i think it would be very useful then there is this question i would say a societal question how do Pakistanis see Chinese coming in such large numbers in their country? You know, uh, how do they appreciate pork being sold in the uh, supermarkets? Uh, how do we appreciate? How do they appreciate uh, Chinese students in miniskirts on the campuses? You know, these are questions we never ask. But since you do field work, uh, I think it's an important dimension. And the last point. The last point for me uh, would be, uh, in fact, uh, echoing uh, what I've heard uh, in Islamabad uh, and, and when I've read in, in Dawn, you know, this idea that China may be the new East India Company, you know, the new imperialist. So when you speak about the pushback, um, do you factor in as well the fear of businessmen, Pakistani businessmen, fearing some competition from China? Uh, th th there is an issue also in CPEC that we may need to mention, uh, land. Land apparently was on the agenda uh, and, and Kashgar based companies were interested in having access to some good land in, 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 in Punjab and elsewhere in Pakistan. So this is of course another dimension, but I think a relevant one to, to figure out uh, how far uh, can Pakistan alienate its sovereignty, uh, at least economically. So, uh, well, if you can't, if you want to respond, <laughs> you're most welcome to respond, and hopefully more questions will come uh, while, while you'll be responding. Thank you very much, and I mean, all, all very, very good questions, and they could be the topics of separate presentations <laughs> altogether. <laughs> um, I think on the Uyghur issue, I mean, it was an issue at the time when Pakistan wasn't 
didn't seem to be able to to control the, the sort of cross border element of it. So with Uyghurs uh, finding uh, refuge in the tribal areas of Pakistan. So it was more one of the concerns that the Chinese side expressed. Um, so at least until th these are discussions that we that, that I've heard before. Again, there is a before and after CPEC, and since CPEC has been has come in, this has really not been on the cards. At the same time, politically, what we've seen is that I mean, I think it was yesterday or the, or the day before yesterday that um, Imran Khan um, sent a letter to all the, the leaders of the Muslim world condemning the President Macron's uh, remarks. So. Uh, and it, it, I think it's quite interesting to see when he was asked uh, about the Uyghur issue and whether it was an issue. I mean, I think both him and, the, and his special advisor say it's a non-issue. I mean, with, I, I don't know enough about it. That was his answer. So I, I don't see that as being something that is probably, it's be, maybe it's being brought up behind closed doors. That's something um, I'm not sure about, but as, as as far as the public element of it is concerned, it's clearly um, it's clearly not there. Uh, the 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 Iran connection it's it's fascinating. It's 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 really interesting, and and I think it's even more interesting after. Okay, sorry, I don't know what happened with the screen. Um, it's even more interesting when if we look at it with um, with the potential Sino-Iranian deal. Um, that we've seen in the making recently. And I think with, with the growing, with the greater Chinese involvement in Iran, I think that's something that's potentially, uh, th th that we are likely to see. Of course, the Saudi Arabia was very interested in investing in, um, I think, an oil refinery in Gwadar. That's what they were saying. Um, and, 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 and Pakistan has, has found itself sort of in the, on the one hand, that they tried to mediate between Iran and Saudi Arabia. At the same time, that they found it very difficult to navigate the relationship with both, especially in in recent in recent years. Uh, and what happened with the OIC and the fact that um, Saudi Arabia didn't want to to convene a foreign ministers meeting um, about Kashmir, I think it's it, it's something which. Um, was particularly interesting to see, given the, the very close bonds and ties between Saudi Arabia and Pakistan. So Iran connected to CPEC. I think that's something which keeps coming up. Uh, and um, I'm afraid I don't have a definitive answer to this, but <laughs> it's, it's, certainly one, um, it's certainly one to follow uh, and, and potentially a growing Chinese influence in Iran um, and Pakistan might be the what what's the missing link that the two countries needed until now. Um, the question: How do Pakistanis see Chinese? I think that's that, that's also a very good question. Um, there was a 2017 Gallup poll report uh, that was um, saying that 85 percent of Pakistanis said that the, the China-Pakistan economic corridor was either important or very important for the country's development. So at the sort of national level, there seems to be this, you know, this overall consensus. At the same time, we don't have a provincial breakdown for this. So I suspect that must be variations in levels of support um, over CPEC and, and, and over China. Uh, and, and indeed, I mean, one of the concerns that were raised, especially in Baluchistan, was about the sort of huge coming in of um, Chinese workers working on CPEC projects. Um, there have been some minor incidents. I remember something in 2018 when the, the, the police uh, needed to intervene in, in, in a fight that uh, sort of a, a small fight that exploded between Pakistanis and Chinese. So there have been minor incidents, but I think that nothing... Um, nothing major um, on that hand, and, and, and they seem to, to sort of get along um, quite well on that hand. China's the new East India Company. Um, that's, I, I'm not entirely sure that's the case. I mean, Pakistan has benefited from some of the CPEC projects. I mean, energy capacity and energy generation was improved. Um, so I think it's a bit of a stretch to define China as the new East India Company. 
At the same time, there, there, there are concerns, the difficulties in agreeing on the financing of the ML1 between Karachi and Peshawar that has emerged in the news recently. I think it's a testament to the fact that this government has been much more cautious to the way in which has accepted or requested financing from China than the previous one. So that, that's for sure. Um, and, and I think it's interesting to see how the, and, and it goes to the point about the business interests and the land interests um, that, that, were be, that are behind CPEC. I think it's interesting to see how some of the most vocal opponents or critical voices, especially in the first phase, came, for instance, from the, the Chambers of Commerce, the Karachi Chambers of Chamber of Commerce, uh, made out made a report that publicly which which was which was quite interesting um, uh, to to sort of read and and they expressed these concerns about the buy in of china of Pakistani companies in for instance special economic zones it wasn't sure whether they would have the same access that was granted to Chinese companies as well so I think there is an element there uh, that that it's important to to sort of follow. Um, I hope Excellent. Uh, I've, yes, I've tried to... <laughs> no, no, but that's fine, Filippo. That's, that's directly fine. Three questions have, have arrived, so I will uh, ask them, uh, I will um, yeah, summarize them for you. The first one Thanks. by Iram Ashraf uh, is, um, is short. Uh, has CPEC created a rift between civil and military relations in Pakistan, uh, or has it brought them on the same page? I ask in light of the change from PMLN rule to PTI. So maybe you can deal with this one first. Yeah, that's, that, that's, what, that's really something I've looked at in depth. Uh, so it's, um, I think what we've seen is that there was a rift in civil military relations under the PMLN, and that's something that's mentioned also in the presentation. And that's, uh, so the answer, if we look at the 2013, 2017, 18 period, that's, that's probably a, a yes, and it was about the control over the project. Uh, at the same time, what we've seen is that following the, the after the advent of Imran Khan as the as the prime minister, uh, basically it's uh, the rift is no longer is no longer there um, because it's it's basically gave, the, the civilian leadership basically gave way uh, to to much greater control on part of the military. So I think on. Now, it's not a matter of not being on the same page because I think both institutions, very powerful within Pakistan, have been always on the same page as far as CPEC is concerned in terms of having CPEC um, being implemented in Pakistan. It's who's in charge of CPEC that has created uh, the sort of challenges and, and, and contestation within the relationship. So on the same page, yes, but within this the sort of same page, there are differences and different views probably on, on who should be in charge. Okay, in fact, Moro Bonavita asked a question in the same vein. Uh, I will summarize it uh, and cite it. After Imran Khan's criticism at the beginning of his term of office, as China began to deal with Pakistani politics differently, how are the criticisms of the CPEC initiatives being handled politically? Is there a corruptive dimension to the CPEC directed at Pakistani political parties. Excellent. That's a very good question, and yes, it's it's directly related to the one that Aram asked. Um, I think yes, there has been a difference. The the as I've as I've tried to also highlight in the presentation, the the, the, the backbone has always been the, the defense component. So China has always been very comfortable dealing with with the Pakistani military as the main point of contact within Pakistan. This is not to say that they didn't have good working relationship with other political parties across the political spectrum. That's, that's certainly the case. But at the same time, their main interlocutor were the military. Interestingly, between 2013 and 2018, so in the PMLN period, China was very comfortable dealing with the PMLN. Uh, and they've made this very clear um, repeatedly and, and in a number of instances. Um, since 2018, they've tried to establish a, a functioning working relationship with the PTI government, but I think they've sort of reverted back to finding in the army the, the, the place where problems are solved and solutions are found as far as the implementation of the China-Pakistan economic corridor is concerned. So there has been, I think there has been a change and a variation in the types of actors that um, uh, 
uh, Chinese leaders, ambassadors, uh, businessmen have been sort of dealing with in the past um, 10 years. Very good. One question by Sophie Yi uh, on the Chinese PSCs that you've mentioned uh, in your talk. She, want, she would like you to elaborate on, on, on the role of the PSCs. Are there an alternative solution for China to provide protections to its offshore national interest without physically deploying its, its army? In short, yes, uh, but uh, it's, it's not something that has been very visible. Uh, I've, I've read a few reports about the, the potential of, of doing this through joint ventures with Pakistanis private security companies. Um, so it's, it's certainly a way to, to increase um, somewhat the presence, uh, but at the same time to, to, to avoid keeping uh, the boots on the ground, if you like. Um, so it, it, it's certainly something that it's been, it's, it's not been particularly under the radar, given also the sensitivity of some of these contracts and of some of the sites where um, they could potentially work. But it, it, it's certainly, um, it, it, it's something that it's worth sort of following up uh, also in the coming months. Yeah, not easy to do it. <laughs> yeah, Last exactly. Question. <laughs> <laughs> Last question, probably. Um, an interesting one bringing India in the picture by, by Thomas Coutinho. What exactly is China's position in the Kashmir conflict between India and Pakistan? And what are the Chinese interests in the conflict, both militarily and economically? That's, that, that, that's a big question. Um, so it's... Um, well, five minutes. <laughs> yeah, but, <laughs> so um, I think it's, it, it's, it's been... It depends on where we look at it. Uh, we were saying just before starting the presentation, one of the, one of the things that we're, we were discussing was about, for instance, Gilgit Baltistan, which is part of the wider Kashmir issue. And, uh, and China's always treated, is a, treated it as an internal matter of Pakistan, and is always advocated as far as the Indo-Pakistani relations are concerned for more, um, you know, for, for trying to resolve their disputes uh, bilaterally, and, and China's multiple times tried to offer their their, their sort of mediation. Um, what we've seen is that um, China in itself is involved in border disputes with with India, as we've seen very visibly this over the summer uh, along the line of Axel control. Um, and, and and as far as the Pakistani dimension of it, and and, and Gilgit Baltistan is concerned, there is probably a China element. That, that, that was discussed in some reports about the desire that and the renewed push behind making Gilgit Baltistan as a full, fully fledged uh, province, the fifth province of Pakistan, uh, as it is the bridge towards, the, towards Xinjiang, um, as it is one of the areas where the special economic zones are still developed. So there is clearly an interest there um, uh, to, to, to sort of develop it. Uh, but again, China, and, and I was in a in a seminar at, at LSE a couple of weeks ago, where um, the, there were Chinese scholars saying basically exactly this. So it's, it's, it's always been treated as an internal matter and as a bilateral matter if we look at the wider Kashmir issue between um, India and, and, and Pakistan. Yeah, thank you very much, Filippo. Thank you. You have covered so much uh, ground in one hour. It's really a, a tour de force. <laughs> and since there is no more, no more question, we can, we can uh, um, end this session on time. And I will let Vignesh now uh, announce what will be the next one. Uh, thanking again, Filippo, for this one. That was really a, a brilliant uh, session. And uh, I'm sure the recording will be uh, also very much in demand. Thank you very much. And thanks again for for all your questions and for the opportunity to present here today. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you, Professor, and thank you, Filippo. Um, in fact, uh, the, the next session, um, that the next meeting that we're going to have as a part of the King's India Institute series is, is, is a sub-series of sorts called Confronting Caste. So we're trying to have three panel discussions, um, and the first one starting on November 12th, and it's going to be chaired by Professor Christoph Jaffalo again. And we're going to discuss caste and city with three scholars, Professor um, uh, Malini Ranganathan from the American University, 
professor bhuvaneshwari raman from sindhul and professor kalayarasan from the from brown so we'll be discussing caste and city on november 12th um, and we'll all we'll be writing to you about this and thank you again filippo there are a couple of questions again on the chat box that i see i mean i'd like you to sort of pursue that on email and then should you have any more questions please reach filippo on email thank you very much everybody for attending and thank you thank you filippo thank you professor jaffalo thank, thank you, you vignesh yeah. thank you all bye 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 thanks